Good morning, everyone. It's a, a distinct honor uh, to uh, be invited to give this uh, opening keynote. It's a pleasure for me to be here, and I'd like to uh, thank all of the organizers uh, here at SLU, Annika, uh, Anders, and uh, Madeline, and others for their warm welcome. So, thank you. Well, let me jump right in because I think time is, is short, so I'll try to get to the key messages and uh, welcome speaking to all of you about this uh, issue uh, you know, uh, during the course of the next two days. So, uh, Africa is a very dynamic place right now. Uh, for the past 10 years, there's been some major uh, changes happening. You can, you can see it uh, happening, so it's a very exciting time. And the topic of my discussion is going to center on what I think is at, is at some of the heart of this dynamism. It's raising distinct challenges, but also some opportunities. So, and this has to do with the fact that land distribution patterns are changing very rapidly. I note that uh, Anna Marie, uh, in her three questions that she left for us, the first one she said is, do we need to think differently about who we're supporting, our, our smallholder, is it smallholder farmers still, or is it agripreneurs and so forth? And my talk will be, I think, speaking to that very issue. Let me use this. I'd like to uh, also acknowledge uh, some of my co-authors here. Uh, Milu Moyanga, also at Michigan State. Kwame Yoba from Ghana at Michigan State. Jordan Chamberlain from uh, the um, Simit, based in Addis Ababa. Uh, Ayala Weinman, also from MSU. Wardan Sia is at the Land, uh, it's called Land Coalition uh, at IFAD in Rome. Anthony Di Cipotto, who's sitting right over here, from the uh, Indaba Institute of Agricultural Policy Research, in, based in Lusaka, Zambia. And Nick Sitko at the FAO. Okay. So, our, uh, there's four issues that I'd like to kind of structure this talk around. The first one is just to document how rapidly land patterns are changing, land holding patterns are changing. The second uh, issue is to talk about what's causing these changes. The third issue is to look at the consequences of this. And then fourth is to think through the implications for policy and strategy. What's the practical implications of this? And also implications for future research. Okay, so let's go to the first point. So, to start out, I want to uh, walk you through this dense uh, fig uh, table. I realize it's a bit dense, but I, I think this will encapsulate what some of the trends that we're talking about. This data set, there's two of them. They come from Tanzania. It's nationally representative survey data collected by the government of Tanzania. The first year that this survey was done was in 2008. Then, four years later in 2012, 2013, there was another survey done. So, uh, based on this survey, uh, the estimates from 20, 2008 is that there were 5.8 million farms in Tanzania. By 2012, this had increased to 6.7 million over a four-year period. So this shows you how rapidly population growth is rising in rural areas. Uh, and now we've broken this down into farm size. And as you can see, 5.4 million of the 5.8, or roughly 93% of all of the farms in Tanzania in 2008 were between the size of zero and five hectares. Okay, the vast majority of farms in Tanzania between zero and five hectares. And then here's the numbers of farms that were between 5 to 10 hectares, 10 to 20, 20 to 100. And then you can see how these things have changed over time. This uh, column shows the growth rates of this size of farm over time. So in a four-year period, the farms between 0 and 5 hectares, they rose by 12.8%, moderate growth. But there were much higher rates of growth in this, these sizes of farms that are bigger, double or triple that rate. This last column here shows the percentage of the total area under cultivation. 
And it turns out that in farms zero to five hectares, the amount of land that was cultivated, or the percentage of land, up there in the booth, uh, could, could we, thank you, okay, great. So, uh, up, so in 2008, 62% uh, of the total farmland in Tanzania was on farms zero to five hectares. But within a four year period, that declined by 6%. And the amount of land or the percentage of land that was on farms that were between 5 and 100 hectares rose by 6%. So just in a four-year period, we're seeing quite interesting rises in the percentage of farmland under medium-scale farms. And I'm defining medium-scale here as farms between 5 and 100 hectares. Okay? So this is Tanzania. Here's Ghana. Uh, in Ghana, we're finding that the percentage of farmland between zero and five hectares declined precipitously within a 15-year period. So that, that's a 14 percentage point decline in the amount of farmland there. And so now farms between five and 100 hectares already account for more than half of the cultivated land in Ghana. So for many years, my perception of African agriculture was that it was distinctly small scale, e except for South Africa and Zimbabwe and parts of Kenya and so forth where there was a long-standing settler agriculture. But even in countries like Ghana, we've already reached a point where the majority of the area under cultivation is on land that's actually bigger than five hectares, and sometimes much bigger than five hectares. So these farms between 20 and 100 hectares, primarily in the northern parts of Ghana, already accounting for over 10% of the total area cultivated. So I'm going to show one more country just to kind of make the case here. Again, this is using uh, nationally representative data from Zambia collected by the uh, Central Statistical Office of the government of Zambia. And once again, you see phenomenal growth rates happening uh, in sizes of farms that are zero to you know, sorry, five to uh, 20 hectares. And even farms now in Zambia of this size are accounting for 52% of the total farmland. And it's rising. So each progressive year which we look at this information, it seems that the scale, the, the percentage of farmland under medium scale is rising. Okay, so, um, so just to summarize so far, the number of small farms growing small, growing, sorry, slowly, the number of medium-scale farms rising quite rapidly, the share of the area under small-scale farms declining, and the share of the area under medium-scale farms uh, seems to be growing quite rapidly. Okay, so far. So now let's go into, oh, sorry, one other thing. Um, the demographic and health surveys that are done in many of these countries they allow us to understand uh, the distribution of farmland between people in urban and rural areas. And as you can see, in many of these countries, let me show Malawi to start with, the percentage of national farmland that is owned by people who reside in urban areas has risen dramatically, 11% up to 18% <coughs> just in the course of six years. And in every place where we're able to look at sort of two points in time, it shows that the percentage of farmland that's owned by urban-based people is rising dramatically. So in Tanzania, uh, astounding to me, I didn't, uh, didn't realize this, that 30% of all of the farmland in Tanzania is owned by people who live in urban areas. Okay. So who are these medium-scale farms? Um, I'm pleased to, to report that uh, based on a study that uh, Anthony and my, some of my colleagues were involved in, we interviewed uh, these medium scale emergent uh, agripreneurs, as, uh, as Anna Marie referred to them, just to kind of find out where they're coming from and why are they investing so rapidly in the food system in Africa. And it turns out that maybe 5% of them are smallholder farmers or were smallholder farmers who successfully grew and innovated out of their small-scale status and became 
you know, viable medium scale farms. Unfortunately, only about 5%. Uh, about 35% of them were people who uh, were relatively well off to start with in rural areas. Uh, they might have, um, you know, been well connected politically uh, based on rural areas. Uh, they account for about 35% of the total. And the majority of these new investors in medium scale farms appear to be coming from urban areas in most countries. There's a, one or two exceptions, but in most of them, we're finding them coming from uh, urban areas. So, here's a little bit of detail about who they are. I'm going to report about Zambia and, and Kenya. Well, in terms of gender, uh, the majority of them are men, uh, four out of five in Kenya's case. Uh, they're not young. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, have been around for quite some time. Um, uh, retirees are in this category. There's a lot of civil service employees who have retired. <coughs> They'll use their income to invest in a farm, 20 hectares, 100 hectares, 200 hectares. That's not uncommon. Uh, we're finding that um, by um, African standards, they're quite well educated. Uh, we also find that uh, a significant proportion of them were either currently or formerly uh, employed by government, uh, so they, they have superior knowledge in terms of how to navigate the land uh, acquisition uh, rules, uh, both the statutory as well as customary laws. So uh, uh, they cultivate, um, well they're not cultivating, they're, they're owning uh, between you know 50 to 74 on average hectares. Uh, at the moment they're cultivating less than half of their land, but almost all of them say that their intention is to scale up over time. And then in terms of when they acquired their land, uh, a high proportion of them acquired them relatively recently. And some of this results from the rise in world food prices that all of you are aware of occurred mm, s starting around 2006, 2007, tripling of food prices. Uh, and this, this gets me kind of into the, the causes of changing farm structure. So the rise in world food prices uh, tended to provide options for people with money. So the top 5% or so of the income distribution in most African countries, quite well off, uh, they have money. And the rise in world food prices gave people an opportunity to put their money into something that was very profitable at that time. Remember, world food prices stayed high for close to eight or nine, ten years. So during this period, we saw lots of uh, new investment in farming by, uh, by lo local investors. It's also the case that when you look at the farm lobbies in many of these countries, the farm lobbies are not generally represented by small-scale farmers. So even though small-scale farmers constitute the vast majority of farms in these countries, they're not well represented generally in the lobbies of, uh, of farmers. So I, I would go so far as to say um, that these farm lobbies have often been captured, captured by the interests of um, relatively well-off um, bigger farmers who really represent the interests of commercial farmers. Uh, they'll lobby for higher support prices for the marketing boards. They're, they're quite usually in support of marketing boards that will raise uh, producer prices, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I don't want to go too much in there, but this is, a, this is an interesting political economy topic all of itself. The th uh, third factor that is changing farm size distributions is population growth. So, and this is changing the structure of farming on the bottom end, on the small end. There's been lots of fragmentation and subdivision uh, associated with population density rising. And in many areas of sub-Saharan Africa, the land frontier has been reached and there just isn't more land to be distributed. So talking about places like rural Kenya, uh, parts of Nigeria, parts of Uganda, certainly Rwanda, parts of southern Malawi. And it turns out, by the way, this is an interesting fact to me, uh, 
that 76% of rural Africa's population is concentrated on 10% of sub-Saharan Africa's rural land. 76% of the people on 10% of the rural land. So it's quite, the settlement patterns are quite concentrated. And where many of rural Africa's population reside, uh, there's, there's not an abundance of land. It's, it's quite, quite uh, constrained. So as subdivision occurs, this has also um, increased the numbers of farms at the very tiny end. Uh, so fragmentation, land inheritance is declining. Uh, I, th I think that some of my colleagues here from countries like Kenya and Rwanda can attest to the fact that while inheriting land used to be considered a birthright of rural people, that's no longer the case in, in many parts of this region. People are less likely to inherit land than they used to be. And for those that are able to inherit land, uh, it's generally much smaller quantities of land, such that it's not viable anymore to make a livelihood out of agriculture. And this is one of the reasons why we're seeing such massive rates of migration out of rural areas and um, this structural transformation, if you will, uh, of the labor force from a society that was primarily engaged in agriculture 15 years ago to one that's rapidly changing now so that a large part of the rural population, especially the youth population, are finding it very difficult to sort of get into agriculture in the ways that they used to be able to do. So uh, you can call this partially a push phenomenon where people are being pushed out of rural areas for, because of land constraints and lack of access. In some areas, it's also a pull where people are, there, there has been agricultural productivity growth. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there's some good things that are happening in many parts of the region. And with that agricultural productivity growth, comes a lot more circulation of money in the rural areas and as that money starts to circulate more in rural areas it creates opportunities job opportunities in the rural non-farm economy that will pull people into you know jobs in the non-farm sector so it's very kind of complicated in some areas it's a positive pull in other places it's more of a push uh, so lots of variation across the region um, but you know, in general, we're finding that land scarcity is really becoming more and more acute, uh, making it uh, difficult for youth to get access to land. We're finding that as the scarcity of land rises, there's much more uh, uh, participation in land markets, both for rental as well as for sale. So in some places, this is still illegal, but it's happening. Uh, and in other places, it's legal and it's also <laughs> happening. So much more uh, participation in land uh, markets, and we're finding uh, that in much of the region, land prices are skyrocketing now. Here's another point that I think uh, some of my colleagues from Africa can attest to this, that uh, in terms of factor prices for agriculture, land prices tend to be increasing dramatically. And, you know, when you think of the induced innovation hypothesis of people like uh, Esther Basarup and uh, Hans Benswanger and Vern Rattan, that group, you know, they would argue that as land prices rise and become more scarce, we're going to see changes in the patterns of agriculture towards more land-saving technologies. And in fact, I think we are. Uh, so uh, let me talk about some of this now. Uh, this point, I think, needs to be borne in mind. We've, we've talked about it, but just to give you the statistics, Sub-Saharan Africa here in red is the only region of the world where rural populations are continuing to rise. And rise fast, too. Uh, <clears throat> Ten years ago, the UN projected that the growth of rural populations in Africa would be quite limited and, and, and low, but they've revised those estimates in the last 10 years because much of the um, survey data in, in Africa is showing that the majority of migration over the last decade is not rural to urban, 
it's rural to rural. So, uh, so there's some saturation of jobs in urban areas, and there's, in Tanzania's case, 69, 70% of all of the migration of rural people is to other rural areas. So we're seeing that uh, this growth rate in <coughs> rural population density is going to continue. I've already mentioned this. This is the price of land relative to the price of maize and the, and the ag wage rates in the Arusha area of Tanzania. Western Tanzania, again, land rental rates skyrocketing. Rural Malawi, r land rental rates are rising faster than wage rates um, and price of maize and so forth. So, so all of this kind of explains why the growth rates of these farms are quite limited. It's associated with a lot of uh, youth difficulties in getting land. And so as the rural youth are sort of getting out of agriculture, uh, we're seeing slow growth rates in these farms, but you know, in the meantime, very fast rates of growth here. Okay, so consequences. Uh, we're seeing mechanization uh, zooming up. Mechanization now accounts for about 12, 15% of total area cultivated in some places. We're seeing more capital using uh, forms of agricultural uh, technologies. Arable land is less fully utilized uh, on these bigger farms, but we're seeing that there's better land management practices on these bigger farms. So this is an issue for kind of long-term sustainable soil fertility management. Is there displacement? Are, 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 are rural indigenous people getting kicked off their land as the medium scale farms rise? The, the evidence suggests that in some places, yes. In s other places, no. Uh, it kind of depends on the country and, and the context. But even though we're finding that there's limited displacement today, one thing is that's very curious, you know, and I think important needs to be emphasized, that as, as investor farmers acquire land in this place and in that place and this place, it, it boxes in, it, it hems in the ability for rural communities to expand their production over time. So the future generations of rural people are going to increasingly find access to land more and more difficult, even if current displacement is not really occurring, okay? So within the existing land tenure patterns, uh, there's limited evidence that we can see of displacement, but certainly it's going to intensify the uh, land constraints that rural people are going to be facing in, in the years to come. Okay, uh, I've already mentioned the, land, the rising land prices, which is a consequence of, uh, of this, and uh, the multiplier effects are changing. So uh, I, think we, I think we all kind of understand this concept of multiplier effects resulting from agricultural productivity growth. But when, think, of, think this through, when you have so many people who are generating that growth residing in urban areas, not rural areas, but urban areas, when they s spend their money as a result of agricultural productivity growth, they're not spending it in the rural economy. They're spending it in urban areas. And so the pattern, the multiplier effects, uh, the territorial effects of agricultural productivity growth, I think are things that we need to think about in terms of where we might see the stimulation of income resulting from this. Uh, this is the nominal value of tractor imports, just to uh, kind of emphasize this growth in, in tractors. Uh, we break it down by country. Uh, Nigeria did have a big rise uh, in tractor um, imports during the height of the world food price surge. Uh, that seems to have tapered off in Nigeria's case. Kenya, this is a place where tractor rental rising rapidly, Tanzania uh, and so forth. And then uh, here is uh, a summary of our um, data on the concentration of land. Gini coefficients. Gini coefficients are a measure of land inequality. And we're seeing that in every country where we've had two or more points to look at, we're seeing a rise in the Gini coefficients <coughs> on land distribution. Meaning that 
you know, as these medium and larger scale farmers are rising, uh, the land patterns are, are becoming more concentrated. Now, to put this in context, uh, in parts of South Asia, like Bangladesh and Vietnam, India, the Gini coefficients are on the order of 0 0.3, 0 0.35, quite low. Uh, and then if you go to Brazil, uh, Guatemala, 0.9, okay? So, so we see that in Sub-Saharan Africa, the evidence is that these uh, countries are somewhere in the middle in terms of land concentration, but it's trending towards the South American kind of model and trending, I would say, quite fast because, um, you know, in just the period of, uh, in Kenya's case, uh, what is this, 12 years, it's already jumped by four percentage points. In Tanzania, four years, it's jumped by six percentage points. So things are, are moving quite rapidly in terms of land concentration. You might be interested in how, in, in land utilization uh, between farms, let's take between over 20 hectares and then under five. So farms under five hectares are basically fully utilizing everything they have. The, the blue is area under crop, and then we have area under pasture and fallow and so forth. And, uh, farms under five are pretty fully utilizing everything they have. Farms over 20 hectares, maybe about a third of what they're uh, owning is cultivated to crops. They have a significant portion of their land under pasture. Uh, there's a, a this is fallowed land, which we can assume is sort of being, you know, in the system. Uh, but, you know, it's less fully utilized, but maybe this is a more sustainable practice over time. So there's kind of pros and cons. Last point, uh, we get to implications for policy. Um, Madam Chair, am, am I, can I take two or three more minutes? Am I, am I, oh, oh, two. All right. So uh, there are obviously important changes in the distribution of farm sizes. Uh, I've already gone through that. Rising inequality of farmland distribution, uh, growing land scarcity that's, been, that's being driven by uh, middle and high income people seeking to acquire land. And by the way, this is not just for cultivation. We're seeing um, lots of speculation. Uh, in places that are in peri-urban areas, people are converting their land into properties and um, you know, rental places. So. It's farming and other things. Uh, as, as population growth you know, clicks along in rural areas, we're seeing new towns arise, tertiary cities and towns. And as those towns spring up, it creates new value, property values around them go up. And so you know, this is part of uh, um, formerly remote land now coming into valued property and, and increasing. Remember that much of what we've reported here is occurring and has occurred during a period of quite high world food prices. So it'll be very interesting, and this is a future question for research, I believe, that as food prices continue to kind of come down as they have the last couple of years, are we still going to see the same rate of increase in these entrepreneurial farms happening? Uh, and then uh, implications for policy, and I'll, I'll end with this uh, point right here is this transition issue. Uh, most, uh, most people, I think, would agree that over time, over the course of the next couple of decades, and just like it's happened in Sweden and in the United States and in most other areas, uh, there is this shift in the labor force over time that moves from farm to non-farm. Generally, non-farm jobs pay better, at least during this transition period, and, and there's increases in sort of the whole overall productivity of the economy when you can move to a more diversified uh, you know, economy. So, so there's probably no doubt that this has to happen and is happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. But the, the transition question is this, that 90% you know, of the farms in rural Africa and 50 or 60% of the labor force are still engaged in you know, semi-subsistence, small-scale agriculture on farms that are zero to five hectares. So they can't be ignored in any viable strategy of rural transformation and urbanization, the theme of this conference. Uh, they, they have, we somehow have to figure out how to make those people be participants uh, 
in the growth process rather than be marginalized by it. So I think on that note, Madam Chair, I'll stop uh, and love to hear your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas.